Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you this morning on behalf of UNOPS, the United Nations Office for Project Services. Before I start, I just want to give you a little, very little bit of background about UNOPS. We are probably one of the smallest entities within the UN family. Uh, we are also significantly unique as we are the only part of the United Nations system which is purely project funded. We receive absolutely no core funds from headquarters, either in Europe or in New York. Uh, therefore, we establish project implementation capacity on the ground in all the countries that we operate in, including obviously Afghanistan. We implement the projects on behalf of our donors and clients. And then when the project is over, we close that capacity and therefore save, save money in terms of long-term overheads. The aim of today's presentation is, as on the slide, to give you a feel for UNOPS operations from an Afghan context, in order to look at the program delivery and to facilitate greater understanding amongst us all about the challenges, risks and opportunities of delivering projects on behalf of our clients, namely the government of Afghanistan, in a country such as Afghanistan itself. The format of the presentation is going to be as follows. First of all, we'll have a quick look at the environment, uh, look at UNOPS in Afghanistan, and then look at the risks, challenges, and indeed the opportunities which exist, not only for us, but for all of us sitting in, the, in this room. Have a quick talk about the procurement arrangements that we have in place, which I would imagine will be of particular interest to yourselves. A quick look at UNOPS Afghanistan's way ahead, and then obviously questions at the end of the panel session. So moving on then, first of all, a quick overview of, of the environment. I'm sure all of you are aware of this, but just a quick recap all the same. Afghanistan is a very, very interesting, very significant, uh, very, and very challenging environment. Uh, 400 odd districts broken up into 34 uh, provinces, stretching south, southwest from the, the edge of the Hindu Kush, mountainous area from the, from the east, running into the center and then falling away into, into the desert plains of the west, the south and the southeast. In terms of population, the population, as you can imagine, is dispersed across the country and is shaped very much by the geographical limitations which are on offer. Also, in a, uh, more importantly, there are geographical and environmental conditions which affect not only population uh, allocation across the country, but also the challenges that are associated with trying to get into the country in order to deliver projects and programs. This is a, a snapshot of the last 10 years from an earthquake perspective, and you can see an awful lot of earthquake activity in the north, northeast, in the edges of the, the Hindu Kush. It makes life very challenging for the Afghans themselves, and it makes it very challenging for those who are implementing projects and pro programs, whether that be the UN or any other um, people, in including yourselves. As far as UNOPS in Afghanistan is concerned, we do quite a lot of work in the construction area, in particular vertical and horizontal. 85% of our program, country program, is in horizontal construction roads. Uh, these are some examples. When we do build roads, we work very closely with our contractors, normally Afghan national contractors, very rarely international, but, but international bidding is, is encouraged, and we certainly don't exclude international contractors from working with us as appropriate. The two bottom slides there, on the left, an inspection of an ongoing road project in Chakran City in Gore province. And in the middle of that group there is the Governor of Gore, who takes a keen interest to make sure that the quality is up, up to speed, and we welcome that. And on the right, the Governor of Bamiyan, uh, indicating uh, the alignment of a new road that she wanted to be built, and has just gone under construction within, within the last month. The purpose of these two photographs is to reinforce the fact that everything we do, we do on behalf of the client, the government of Afghanistan. We listen to their needs, we advocate those needs on their behalf to the donor community and make sure that when we implement that we are delivering for the government and for the people. We also are busy building hospitals and clinics across the country. This is an example of an ongoing project, phase one funded by the Lithuanian and Greek governments, phase two which has started last month 
under the uh, funding arrangements from the Japanese. We're also involved in other vertical construction in the educational sector, working for the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Higher Education, doing schools, bottom, bottom right slide, a girls' school, Kabul uh, Sada High School in, in Kabul itself, and also above that, the initial discussions with the client, in this case, Kabul University, for the construction of a computer faculty science block in the Kabul University compound. Airports. This, I can assure you, is, is only an architectural uh, impression. Um, it's not what we've built yet, but this project is going to be starting within the next three weeks. This is JICA funded and re renovating, rehabilitating on a significant basis the airport facilities at Banyan City. Environment. We also do quite a lot of work within the environmental uh, sector, whether that be disaster risk management or using and promoting the use of solar energy. Alternative energy is something which Afghanistan needs very desperately, and UNOPS is certainly one of the leading entities, certainly within the UN family, for promoting this, advocating it with both the government and the donor community to make sure that the best use of solar energy can be employed across the country wherever possible. You'll also notice in the photograph on the bottom left that we do promote wherever possible, the empowerment of women. We look for opportunities to make sure that women in the local communities are given a chance to be educated, trained, and even employed. Not always possible for various reasons as far as the construction industry is concerned on the roads, but where it is possible, we make sure we intervene and interact with the female population in order to make sure that they have a chance to benefit from construction activities in their local areas. This particular example is Gavin Weaving, which is being led by, by women both in the centre and up in the north, but also other activities such as baking, baking bread, which they then sell to the construction parties who are actually doing the road construction or the road maintenance. In terms of our country programme, it's shaped by the need to support sustainable Afghan transition. This is of key strategic importance to the government and to all of us. And anything we do has to be in support of that transition ambition. All our programmatic uh, activities are shaped by what we call the Holy Trinity. We need to be on time, within budget, and to the appropriate levels of quality. This is a snapshot of the, the clients and the donors who we work for and with at the moment. In particular, the, the first two on the, the client side, the Ministry of Public Works and the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development, because as I said earlier, 85% of our activities are really, involves roads construction. In terms of a programmatic overview, we have about a $400 million country program. We're active physically on the ground in 32 out of the 34 provinces across the country. We have 35 ongoing projects at the moment. We have a, a business acquisition target of $108 million, which we're well on track not only to reach but also to exceed. Last year's target was higher than that and we exceeded it by 133%. There is an awful lot of business, there is an awful lot, lot of needs still existing in Afghanistan and that will likely continue between now and at least the end of 2014 when complete transition should be achieved. <coughs> Excuse me. As far, as far as delivery is concerned, our target this year is to deliver, I burn, $86 million uh, worth of project funds across the country. Again, a challenge in this particular environment for a whole host of reasons which we'll come to very shortly. This is a, <coughs> a bell-shaped graph which shows our planned delivery during the course of this year. The reason I've put it up is not not to show you the details of our, our monthly forecast of delivery, but rather to focus on the fact that we are currently in a construction window. If you're construction heavy, then you have to accept that one key aspect which will influence your ability to deliver is the weather. And therefore we expect to be uh, at high delivery tempo during the summer months, and then it tails off down during, during the winter. Risks, challenges and opportunities. Let's start off first by looking at the risks. This is a snapshot of insurgent-related activities that have taken place 
from 2003 up until 2012, broken down into the months, months of the year. The circled area is against this year's first quarter, January, February, and March. You won't be able to see all the, the details, but the, the, the general impression you should be able to see about that is back in 2003 there were very few incidents, and they've been steadily increasing during the, the intervening nine years. 2011 was, was particularly bad. You'll see the, the yellow lines just to the right of the high spikes, which is 2011. The yellow lines are 2012. And in the first quarter, the number of incidents was significantly less than the previous year. The overall estimate, however, is that things continue to be less than good. And as one, one of my colleagues put it recently, they're getting worse only at a slower rate. Now there is room for encouragement there, but one has to be cognizant of the fact that we do still have to operate in an insecure and violent environment. And as one of the previous speakers said yesterday, this isn't post-conflict, it is indeed a conflict zone. This is the UN threat map. It shows quite clearly that the main threat remains from the west through the south and into the southeast. But there's significant room for um, deployability, maneuverability, and also implementation and delivery in the centre and in the north and the nor northeast. And notice there that Bangan province, right in the centre, is the only province of the country which is deemed from a UN perspective to be uh, of no threat. We are maximising that opportunity by implementing several projects in Bangan as I speak. The challenges then. These are some of the challenges. Starting off from the, the, the top, top left, as I just said, the ongoing uncertainty. This isn't post-conflict, it, it is conflict, and all of us need to be cognizant of that fact. Capacity. There still needs to be improvement in terms of in, enhancing and increasing institutional capacity within the, the elements of government, as well as contractive capacity within the Afghan private sector. UNOPS plays a key role in this, we like to think, in terms of uh, the individual private sector companies themselves. Every time that we contract, we do factor in an element of capacity building for those contractors. And even before contracting, we do, wherever possible, try and enhance contractors' capacity through education and training so that they stand a better chance in, in tendering for contracts that are ongoing. Corruption. Corruption is, will come as no surprise to you. It remains a, a problem within the country and in all elements of the country. And I'll stick my hand up now and admit that we, the United Nations, face just as much of, of a problem as many other sectors. So it is endemic, but no, no one is free of this particular problem. But what we do is we bring internationally recognized best practices to the fore in order to make sure that corruption is eradicated and we do everything we possibly can to make sure that as far as the UN and the UNOPS in particular is concerned, corruption is not allowed to take place. I've already talked about the weather. The weather is significant. It was particularly harsh this winter, one of the harshest winters Afghanistan and the Afghan people have had to suffer for nearly 30 years. And it does have an impact on our ability to deliver, and it has an impact on your ability to deliver on our, on our behalf, something worth bearing in mind. And funding and timelines. <laughs> we have to face the reality of the fact that transition is coming and what that actually means in, on the ground. What we know already, of course, is there will be a significant withdrawal of international military forces between now and the end of 2014, and some countries, France included, are already beginning to pull out. That will have an impact not only on the environment from a security perspective, it will also have an impact in terms of the amount of donor funds that are being channeled in the coming months and the next few years into Afghanistan. It's incumbent upon us all to take the responsibility now to make sure that whatever funds are channeled into Afghanistan are used to the best purpose and best effect for the Afghan people. There are opportunities. The first half of this slide is a more strategic approach to the opportunities that are available. The second half in the bold, uh, bold writing are opportunities for the people sitting in this audience. Strategically, 
there is an opportunity for all of us to continue contributing to an enhanced reconstruction and development program in Afghanistan, one of the, the, the countries great, most greatly in need in the world for such assistance. We need to continue to support the Afghan-owned transition process. Without that, then there is no future. But most importantly, in my opinion, we have to benefit the Afghan people. And I'd like to think that all of us here, whether you're in the private sector or the public sector, are focused on assisting and improving the lives of the Afghans. And finally, enhancing the capacity of both the middle public and private sectors, so that there is a degree of sustainability, not just now, but also in the years to come. For people sitting in the audience today, your opportunities are in there are construction, procurement and advisory services. Construction, vertical and horizontal, procurement, goods and services. What does that actually mean? I'm not going to put up now any specific details about the tenders that are about to be launched by UNOPS, of which there will be many in the coming weeks and months, because that's not how we operate. We certainly don't give an indication of values of, of, of contracts that are going to be awarded. That's for you to work out yourselves. But these are the types of areas that we'll, we will be floating tenders in the, in the coming weeks. Roads in, in Kabul, irrigation in the Dusab's new, new city. I'm very pleased to, to say that very, very uh, recently, in fact in the last four days, we've signed an agreement with um, his, his Honourable Mr. Hazardada's organisation, a very capable, uh, a very forward-looking organisation, DCDA, and it's a great privilege for you and us to be supporting that and working on his behalf to support the development of the new city. The airport in Bamiya, both one-way development and vertical buildings, as I've already mentioned. Roads, a massive expansion in our ongoing roads program in, in Uruzgan. The same detail in Gore and in Herat, particularly focusing on what is likely to be the start, imminently, of construction on the east-west corridor between Chakran City and, and Herat in the west. Hospitals, hospitals in Gore in particular, we will be tendering for very shortly, and also Kabul University. There are opportunities out there, it's mostly uh, horizontal, some vertical, but we look to anyone who has the capacity to look at our, our procurement pages and bid if they're interested. Taking me on the procurement, this is the UNOPS website at the top, and below is the link specifically to our procurement page. If you want more details about this and you want to see how to get into this, then please see us. We'll be at table 15 during the round table session this afternoon. But essentially, if you go to the UNOPS page, then you'll get to the Procurement and Supply Chain Management page and under related links on the right, if you click there, then it will take you specifically to the Supplier's Information page. It will give you information about how to become a, a registered supplier or vendor for you and ops. And it will also list you the business opportunities. You can search by any country across the world that you and ops is operating in, including Afghanistan, and if you click on Afghanistan, you'll see all our tenders that are out, of, out at the moment, and if you keep an eye on that page, you'll see every tender that's coming up in the next few weeks in those areas that I showed two or three slides ago. You'll also be able to see, as you can see from the slide, awarded contracts. Every contract that we, we initiate with a vendor across the world is on our website. This is for transparency reasons, so anybody has the ability and the right to go in and find out who was awarded a contract to do what job, where, and to what value. I would put a cautionary note saying that within Afghanistan, there are occasions, very few, but some occasions, where we will not list all the information about a contract, and the only reason we will not do that if it's considered to be insecure for the contractor to place that information on the website. Very quickly then, the way ahead. The way ahead for you and Ops is quite simple. We're going to continue to act as the preferred implementing partner of the government of Afghanistan and the donor community. We are, we are uh, the, the preferred partner uh, at the moment. We intend to stay that way. We want to uh, establish ourselves and maintain ourselves as an entity that brings value for money. We want to make sure that we shape ourselves ready for what's likely to be an imminent surge of activities across the country prior to the 2014 transition and the uncertainty thereafter. And we also, and most importantly, are preparing our exit strategy. UNOPS is not an entity that likes to hang around. We want to come in, we want to add value while that value is required, and then, at the right time, 
When the clients and the donors don't need us, we exit. We do not hang around. We are not like the rest of the UN family, project funded, do the job and get out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my presentation and I think we'll have questions.